letting me know. Okay, recording is on. Welcome to our class today, BC 111 on faith. Um, we just prayed, and now we're going to get into the lesson. Not sure what's going on here. Okay. All right, so we were talking about various ways in which we exercise faith. All right, so you have faith in God, you're meditating in His Word, uh, you know, you're looking into His Word, and His Word is building faith in you. Okay, how do you exercise that faith? How do you bring that faith out of your heart so that it can cause things to happen in everyday life? In our circumstances so the first thing we we discussed was about confession confession releases faith that was in the previous chapter chapter 11 then we're talking about actions actions demonstrate faith so you have to act your faith and that means you you believe in your heart now you've got to act in line with that faith right do what whatever you can do that's why even in the ministry of jesus you know uh jesus would tell people things like stretch out your hands now the man you know imagine a man who's uh, who's got his hand you know deformed and jesus tells him stretch out your hand and he says jesus sorry i was born like this i never stretch out my hand what are you telling me to do but Jesus told him, stretch out your hand. So you can imagine, you know, as this man started trying to do that, so he, he just had to, in his whole life, he may have never done it, or maybe he has, but his hand is deformed, what, you know. But as he tries to do it, right, his, uh, you can't see me, or... Do you want the lights? Uh, it's just a little too bright for the eyes. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is comfortable. All right. Unless you want to see me. <laughs> it's, it's okay. All right. So what was it? Yeah. So as he begins to move his hand, you can imagine the miracle. Or imagine in John 5, this man for 40 years has been crippled. You know, he's, 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 he's been lying flat. You know, whatever he's never walked then jesus what does jesus tell him rise take up your bed go he could say jesus uh i've never done it what are you telling me to do rise take up your bed and walk i would imagine for peter you know in luke 5 he has spent the whole night fishing you know uh, they've not caught anything. After Jesus uses the boat, he gives the boat back to Peter. And he says, Peter, go back into the deep and throw your net for a catch. So he's telling him to do something. He has to act his faith. You know, Peter, of course, is saying, Peter, uh, Lord, we have worked all night and we have not caught anything but because you are saying it i will do it see that is faith in the natural he has tried everything all night they've been fishing they have not caught anything same area same place we have been fishing all night we have not caught anything but because you are saying it because Jesus, you are saying, go and put your net. I will do it. So that is faith in action. And when he did it, he saw the miracle. Okay. So like there's so many examples we can see in the Bible. Or another time, a blind man. Jesus made clay. He put spit, made clay, put it on his eyes. 
and then he told them go wash in the pool go wash now this blind man has a choice either he can go and wash he can take somebody's help hey take me to the pool i, I want to wash he can ask his faith or he can say oh this jesus simply saying something but he went with faith see he's acting his faith maybe while he was going in his mind hey, nothing will happen how many times you already washed in that pool you had full bath in the pool so many times nothing has happened why is it going to be different today just because they put some clay on your eyes he must have had bath in the pool so many times so his mind must be thinking all those things what is going to happen or his mind must be thinking hey, if jesus wanted to heal you he would have healed you right there why should he send you to the pool so many things so many questions could be in his mind at that time but he had to act his faith he had to do it so you can imagine with somebody's help he goes to the pool and when he washes he gets his sight and his miracle happens so like that in life for us right today our situations may be different you know what 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 we are facing may be different but when god speaks a word we have to act on it we have to that is one way to show we have faith that is one way to uh, bring the faith that is in our heart into our life you act on it and god speaks a word and then that action will cause the miracle to take place okay so that's what we are talking about uh so we looked at you know so many examples uh and that's so want to yeah read that all right any questions on this acting our faith now only one thing i want to say we must not be presumptuous when acting our faith so what do you mean presumptuous presumptuous means don't do something without faith in your heart first okay and don't do something just because somebody else is doing it so imagine this blind man he put you know, clay i think other people will come take the, they make their own clay put on there as they also go and wash will it happen no because it was for this man that jesus put the clay on his eyes and told him to go he didn't tell everybody correct so if the others also copied him that would be presumption that means they are just copying somebody else okay i remember in school and when we were in school when we were learning about faith we were all very excited so we were in 9th 10th 11th you know 9th 10th 11th standard those that age and we were all excited about faith and some of us we did silly things i remember some friends you know uh, uh, Francis, I'm not mentioning you. I'm talking about my friends. They took off their glasses. They say, "I do. I don't need glass. I, I I will say, the Lord Jesus healed me." Then poor fellows, they're sitting. They can't see the boards. They were struggling. So that was not faith. it was more like excitement right they were, they were excited learning about faith but remember first we have to have faith in our heart then we must act if we don't have faith in our hearts with the word of god and then we just simply do something like like what we had, they just took up their glasses then eventually after a few months they had to put it back <laughs> so we went through all those all those things um uh, 
So if you, if, you, if you do something presumptuously, just because somebody else is doing it or we feel excited, uh, we will hurt, we could hurt ourselves. Okay? So, also when you're ministering healing to some people, right? Now, in the Bible, we see the Lord saying, rise, take up your bed and walk, or... Uh, uh, other uh, other things, you know, he says, go wash in the pool. Or, you know, he tells them to act the thing. Now, we have to be careful when we are ministering to people. Right? Don't, so we, we, so we must be careful. That is, we want them to act their faith. We want to get them, encourage them to act their faith. But we don't want them to hurt themselves if they don't have faith. Example, suppose there are three people in a wheelchair. Okay. And you're teaching, you're ministering about faith. That the Lord can heal you. The Lord is our healer. And if they have faith, so you can encourage them. You know, no, you believe that God is your healer, act your faith. Do what you can do. So, uh, so these three people in the wheelchair, maybe one person will move their legs and will try to get up and try to walk. Okay, but don't force them. Okay. Now, we've done it also. You know, so come on, get up, we'll help you walk. Then finally, you put them back in the wheelchair and you know, they go back to the wheelchair. It's happened that way. Uh, so if they have faith and they're ready, you can tell them. Sometimes if it is a clear word from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit tells you, tell them to rise up. Then you do it. See, that's different where it's a clear word. So if you're teaching about faith, you let them act according to their faith. Don't force them because they can hurt themselves. But if the Holy Spirit gives you a word saying, tell all three of them or tell the person on the first chair to rise up or whatever. If the Holy Spirit gives you a word, then you say that. Because then that is a clear instruction. You can tell, okay, the person in this first wheelchair, rise up. The Holy Spirit has given you a word. But if the Holy Spirit has not given you a word, and you are only you're teaching about the Lord who is our healer, that is true. The word of God is always true. But don't force people. Okay? They must act according to their. It's very important. Otherwise, uh, we could hurt people. So don't force all three of you. Get up. Come on. Get up. Why are you sitting? Get up. They may get up momentarily. Camera, everybody will be there. After service over, all three will sit back in the wheelchair and go. What is the use? That is, that is of no use. They will feel ashamed. They will feel hurt, you know. So, but in the camera, it looks nice at that moment. Ah, they're all standing up, but they won't show. After ten minutes, they went back and sat in the chair. See, so we must avoid that. Don't hurt people. Okay. So understand the difference. Hmm? Acting our faith is important, but each person must act according to their faith don't force people unless you have a clear word from the holy spirit if the holy spirit has given you a word saying tell that person or tell the second person or tell all whatever rise up get up then you say because then the holy spirit will do it he will do it because he's given you a word all you have to do is speak it they have to start acting on it and they start acting on it, they will receive their miracle. You're understanding the 
difference. Okay. So just to explain it, otherwise, sometimes we'll we might just out of zeal do things and people will get hurt. So next one. Okay, let me check if there are any questions on the chat. Uh, if we, before we go forward. All right. Um, online insurance, everyone's okay. Any questions? Yeah, so far? Everyone's good? All right. Let's go forward. Sorry? Okay. Uh, we have a question here in class. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I can't hear you uh, because of the fan behind me. Speak a little louder. Uh, okay, Smith Wigglesworth had the gift of healing and imagine. Okay, yes, okay. Okay, so the question here, Ren is Ren's question is uh, about Smith Wigglesworth. We know him uh, as an apostle of faith. Uh, early part of the nineteenth or twentieth century, great man of faith. Um, um, so in his healing meetings, uh, Smith Wigglesworth at times was very rough with people. So he would, for example, if somebody had a tumor, he would punch them, do things like that. And uh, and then people would ask him, why are you doing that? Because you know you could hurt somebody. You, you're hitting somebody, you could hurt them. So his response would be, I am do I'm punching the devil, I'm not punching the person. Okay, that's Kind of how he ministered. Now. now it's not like every person he did this. He didn't do this to every person. On occasion, he would do these things, or he would minister like this. So, again, here, very important. If God moves you to do something like this, come, John. Happy birthday. So if God moves you to do something like this, then you do it. But you cannot do it uh, out of your own mind. Then you will hurt people. You know? Uh, so we have to be, we would say, under the anointing. Or we have to be uh, in tune with the Holy Spirit. And if he's moving you to do this, okay. Because the real test is somebody got healed. Suppose he punched people and nobody got healed, then he will be in big trouble. Yeah. But here, when he did something, there was the result. People got healed. The tumor disappeared. Or, uh, the, yeah, the, the, so it is very clear that he was doing it under the anointing, under the leading of the Holy Spirit. So under that, yes, if the Holy Spirit is leading you to do something very unusual, like we saw in the case of Jesus, you know, he didn't make clay and put it on every blind person's eyes. Yeah, it was, we have just one account of that. He didn't do it for everybody. So like that, if the Holy Spirit is leading you to do something, do it. Now, uh, the Holy Spirit may work that way more often through certain people's lives than through others. Yeah. So one of the things we understand is usually the way God manifests or the way God operates through us is aligned or is, is in line with the way he has designed us. You know, uh, So somebody may be, maybe by nature, they're very rough. <laughs> so, you know, God just works through that design. Somebody, maybe by nature, may be very soft and gentle. God works through that. You know, they can be, the Holy Spirit will work through their 
you could say their temperament, their personality, the way he has designed them, God will work through them. So that's why we have diversity, diversities of operations. See, not everybody is the same. Now, God works in a diversities of way, operations, diversities of manifestations. So that's another thing to keep in mind. That is, he, the expression of God through your life will usually be in line with the way he's designed you to be. So you work through that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question, uh, another question here, Anand's asking, is uh, will God do such unusual things in the sense, you know, maybe uh, use water or, you know, pastors using water or ash or telling people to go wash in a river or things like that. So, the answer is yes, because uh, we can, there is, what to say, we cannot confine God. Like we can't say God will only do like this, right? God can do anything. Right? So he can work through people any way he desires, right? But at the same time, we have to test every expression of the holy or every expression whether it is really from god or whether they are just simply making it up because people can simply make up something no come come i've got one holy water bottle you take this you drink five bottles you'll get fine <laughs> simply they can make up and then uh, if people will sit you know they they may just fall for it and do that so people can simply do it or maybe God can genuinely tell a person, you do like this. It is possible because in the Bible, both Old Testament, New Testament, God has worked in many different ways. Many different ways. You know, Moses, he was using a rod. You know, it doesn't mean everybody went and bought one rod and started. <laughs> no. In Moses' case, God was working like that. So, you know, uh, and you know, uh, Elisha, he took the mantle of Elijah and he struck the river, the river parted. But it doesn't mean everybody started using one shawl and <laughs> striking. No. God worked through certain people like that. It's okay. God is God. Uh, uh, he, we can't restrict him. But we can test. We can check. Is this real? What tests should we do? One very important thing, is the person pointing people to Jesus? Very important. Okay. Maybe praying for the sick, ministering supernaturally. Okay. But the goal is to draw people closer to Jesus. Not to ourselves, not to something else, not to even to the ministry. To draw people or point people to Jesus. The signs, the wonders, the miracles are to always move people to Jesus. So that's the one thing. Because the Holy Spirit will always, so I'll come to your question. The Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit doesn't glorify the person, the minister. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. So if it's really from the Spirit, that's what will happen. People will be pointed to Jesus, right? Um, yeah, so that would be the main test: is are we pointing people to Jesus Christ, uh, giving glory to God, and so on? So we have to test it, right? Uh, Sean, what was your question? Yeah, very clearly. Yeah, if you can take the mic, Sean. Uh, then I can hear you because the span is right above me. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, so what if the person pointing towards Jesus or bringing people towards Jesus isn't using a right doctrine or right idea about Jesus? Oh, so he has to point people to the real Jesus. You know, so example, if I put up one picture of Jesus, <laughs> I say, okay, all of you come and worship this picture of Jesus. That is wrong. It is a picture of Jesus. But we don't worship the picture of we worship the living, risen Jesus. So even if I put example I'm giving, even if I put a picture of Jesus, that is not Jesus. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. Or you say infant Jesus. Infant Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible is the one who died on the cross, who was buried, rose up again, who is alive today, who is seated. So even infant Jesus, we don't worship infant Jesus. We worship risen Jesus. You understand? So that is good, right? That's a good point. We have to point to the Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, the one who is risen, who is Lord, who is God. Okay? So that's important. Okay, uh, I'll pause here just to make sure if there are any questions on the chat. Okay, all right, on the chat, there's a question here from Nina. If we are praying for someone with an ailment, we don't ask them to do something, uh, we don't ask them to do something they couldn't do unless there's a clear leading from the Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, Nina's question is, um, suppose you're praying for somebody, um, uh, should be uh, ask them to do something they couldn't do unless there's a clear leading of the Holy Spirit. So there is a balance, right? So suppose you're praying for somebody, you can ask them to do something they couldn't do without hurting themselves, just as an act of faith, right? So you're encouraging them, you know. So, uh, so suppose you're praying for somebody, you know. Suppose they had a lot of pain, then you can say, okay, check and see if the pain is gone. There's nothing wrong in doing that. You're just telling them to check uh, to see if the pain is gone, or something they some way that they can tell that the healing has happened or the healing has started to happen. There's nothing wrong in that. It's also uh, uh, an encouragement for them to act their faith that yes, God, I'm expecting something to happen to me. So that's the first part. So what we were trying to say is, don't push them to do something that will hurt them. That's the that's the main thing. Now, um, so that's so that's in general. So when you, you, we teach the word to somebody, uh, we pray for them. Then we say, okay, check and see. You know, are you okay? Can you stretch your if, if the hand they couldn't stretch? Okay, try and see. Can you stretch your hand? And they say, oh yeah, I can do it. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, now everything's fine. You know, so that is that is okay. It's a safe thing. You're encouraging them to uh, do it. So that's fine. What we were trying to say is, don't tell them to do something that would harm themselves, that would hurt themselves. That is, we should avoid that. Uh, and then, of course, if the Holy Spirit gives us a clear word, we just say, you know, do this. Or the Lord, the Lord is showing me this, so then they are safe to act on it because it's a clear word from the Holy Spirit. Uh, I hope I clarified that part, Nina. Um, Judge and Joel. His question is, Elisha wanted a double portion of what Elijah was doing for the Lord, his ministry and anointing. So does that mean we also can desire and pray for such anointing upon our lives? Even today, there are men and women of God who inspire me personally just by their life and ministry. Uh, so the answer is definitely we can. Uh, we can pray and ask the Lord, saying, God, you know, how you've used so-and-so, please use me, or the anointing that you've given, or the grace you've given so-and-so, please give me. That's perfectly fine. But um, we need to understand certain things about how impartation happens, how, uh, how the transfer of anointing happens. It doesn't, it's not, you know, it's not a, a simple thing. Now, if you go to our church website, uh, apcwo.org. Uh, on our home page, on the bottom of the page, there is um, 
or maybe I can show it to you. So just I can show it to you and then you can have a look at it. I'll just share the screen with you just a moment. All right, let me share this with you. All right, so if you go to our church website, apcw.org, on our home page, you scroll down, there's a, there's a section called Recommended Sermon Series. Over here, uh, you will find... Uh, a series called, um, yeah, Mentoring, Anointing, and Impartation. So you, if you click on that, Mentoring, Anointing, and Impartation. So it's a three-part sermon series. And this third part, uh, we share about how, you know, how impartation happens. So I'd encourage you to, uh, do that. Uh, you, know, you can listen to it, of course, and we have the sermon notes as well, so you can look at the sermon notes. Um, and we talk about, you know, how impartation happens. Um, that it's aligned. You know, impartation is always aligned. The call of God on your life. It takes place in a measure. Uh, you know, whatever you receive through impartation, it still has to be nurtured and developed. Uh, you cannot grow beyond what, uh, you can grow beyond, but as you develop it, uh, you can receive impartation, you know, from more than one. It depends on your hunger and God's assignment. It takes place through association. It takes, it can take place remotely. It cannot be purchased with money. Anyway, you can go through it. There are a lot of, a lot of things here that will, you know, as far as impartation is concerned. The important thing is this, uh, impartation always happens aligned to the call of God on your life. So for example, and I, and I often use this uh, in a joking way, I can't go to Darlene Jack and say, please lay your hand on me and impart anointing to be a worship leader. You know, Darlene Jack, she, she can pour a bucket of oil on me, nothing will happen. Because that's not God's call on my life, right? I'm not called or... That's not the call of God to be a worship leader. So I, I cannot forcibly receive an impartation that is not aligned to the call of God on my life. Right? So that's something very important. Many people uh, don't understand that. The impartation is always aligned to God's assignment on your life. What, did, what has God called you to do? In, that, in agreement with that, in, in alignment to the call of God is where impartation happens. Now, if darling Jack lays hands on me and prays for me, maybe, you know, I might experience a little bit more, you know, in, in my personal worship, but surely I will not become a worship leader. That's not the call of God on my life. So you need to understand that. Another important thing I'll highlight, and you can read all this in that sermon notes, but another important thing is that uh, the impartation has to be nurtured and developed. So just because somebody lays hands and imparts doesn't mean you will automatic or we will automatically operate at that same level. We grow into it. So it's almost like it's being given to us, but we grow into it. It has to be nurtured. And these are some things there, uh, but there's a lot more you can you can read. You know. Okay. All right. Hope we answered your question. Um, sounds good. Thank you. Nina, I hope I answered your question earlier. Uh, yeah. and, all right. So what's another way to express our faith in God? This is chapter 13. It is praise expresses faith. Praise expresses faith. Okay, so here's another way. In Romans 4, 17 to 20, talking about Abraham, it's talking about Abraham's faith, and then in verse 20 it says, he was giving glory to God, being fully persuaded, um, verse 21, sorry, verse, verse 20, he did not waver, Romans 4, 20, 
He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So giving praise to God. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, or giving praise to God. So giving praise to God is a way for us to exercise or to express and even to be strengthened in our faith. So imagine, you know, somebody prays, you know, you're, you're, a person is not well, sick. A person meditates in the word of God. Say, God, this is your word. I thank you. And then even before you receive healing, feel the healing in your body, you start giving glory to God. Father, I thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. In their body at that moment, they may still feel bad. They may still feel sick. But they're giving praise to God even before it happens in the natural. Because they believe the word. They believe God will fulfill his word. So they are thanking him for the healing before it has happened because God will fulfill his word, right? So they're giving praise to God. Father, I thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. I thank you, Father God, that every cell in my body is well. I thank you, Father, that I'm able to, you know, go about a good life and normal life. So they're giving praise to God. They're giving glory to God even before it and so like that, we can do for any situation, you know, maybe there's a problem, As, uh, you know, or some things are happening. You, 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 you meditate in the word of God concerning that. You believe God's word concerning that. Then you praise God even before the problem is solved. Even before problems. Father, I praise you that you have taken care of this. Father, I thank you the mountain is moved. I thank you the problem is solved. Lord, I praise you. You are good. You're faithful. You're loving. What are you doing? You are expressing your faith in God through your praise, through your worship, through giving thanks, giving glory to God. You're expressing your faith. Right. So that's another way, third way. Think about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. Uh, you know, uh, they had gone to Philippi. There, uh, you know, uh, God was working. Uh, this this uh, slave girl who was a fortune teller was delivered. People caught Paul and Silas. They put them in the prison. They put them in the inner prison, way inside. They put them in chains. They put them in put their feet in stocks. That means no way escape. you can escape. Your feet are put in the ground, fully chained inside the prison, in a prison. And the Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing and praising God, singing hymns and praising God. Think about that. Now, we don't know what they sang, what songs they sang, but I'm sure they were just praising God for his goodness, his faithfulness, that he is their deliverer, that he is taking care of them. They must be magnifying God. They were giving glory to God in that situation. It's not easy. But the Bible says, as they sang, their chains fell off. Not only their chains, but the chains of all the prisoners and the gates were open. So they didn't sing after their chains fell. They were singing before their chains fell. They were singing before the gates were opened. You see, they were praising God even before the things happened. And then things happened. Okay, So, same thing. It is our way of expressing faith in God. God, I believe you. I praise you. Even though things at this moment may seem difficult. I still praise you. Okay? So learn to praise God. Father, I praise you. Know, just praise Him uh, even before 
things happen. It's a way of expressing our faith in God. Next, another important part of expressing faith in God is being patient or it is having endurance. So this is lesson number 14. Right? It is being patient. And this is the difficult part. This is the difficult part. Because we want everything. What of what? Jaldi. <laughs> everything must happen immediately. But not like that. In, in, you know, God is interested in developing who we are. Of course, he wants to meet our needs. He wants to provide for us and all that. But at the same time, he wants to develop us as people. And one of the ways by which we are developed is as we endure, as we are patient, as we go through time. So, uh, Sean, you have a question? Uh, no, sir, I just want to add that a good example for a person without impatience from the Bible is Saul. As you can see, when um, Samuel told to wait in order to sacrifice, he didn't wait, but he went to the sacrifice by himself instead of waiting for Samuel to come and do this uh, sacrifice. Right, right. Yeah, good, good example. So uh, Sean just said that, you know, Saul didn't wait for Samuel to come in order to make sacrifice, but he went and did something he was not supposed to do, and there were consequences for that. So. Um, so when we have faith in God, right, we have to patiently wait from the time we exercise faith till we see the result of our faith in God. Right? So in the spiritual realm, it is done. In the spiritual realm, it is done. But for that result to manifest, to appear, in the natural sometimes it takes time yeah and then you hear lots of testimonies where when people persevere they see uh the result they, they don't give up easily but because they persevered they see the miracle right um some scriptures here uh hebrew 6 verse 12 it's talking about abraham and it says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So uh, how did they receive the promise? It was faith and patience or endurance. Right? So they had to add, they had to have faith, but in addition to faith, they had to have patience. And then they inherited the promise. They saw the promise. Uh, again, Hebrews 10, 35, 36 says, Do not cast away your confidence. I mean, don't let, let it go. Don't throw it off. Right? Because that confidence that you and I have in God, it has great reward. There is going to be a good outcome. But what do we need? For you have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So you do the will of God, yeah, but then you need endurance. You need to be patient so that you can receive the promise. Okay, so this is part of our, uh, our journey of faith, of us expressing faith in God. So, you know. The, the great example there is of Abraham, who he waited, uh, actually not nearly 10 years, but more than 10 years from the time God called Abraham from the age of 75 till the age of 100. So that's 25 years. But God reassured him, you know, uh, 15 years down the road. So that's why I put 10 years, but totally it's 25 years. Um, before he could see the birth of Isaac. Yeah. Now, we can all wonder, 
Why did God make him wait 25 years? One year is okay. Two years, three years, maybe five years. 25 years. God made Abraham wait to give him one son. That's a long time. But God is pointing us to Abraham. He says, follow his faith. Walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. Follow his faith. Now Abraham had questions, Sarah had questions along the way. It's not like they were absolutely fine. They had, you know, in Genesis 15, Abraham asks God directly, God, what happened to your promise? So he had those questions. Sarah also laughed. Huh? What is this you're telling I'm going to have? But they overcame that. Yes, Vimal, what's your question? Sit down, sit down. Why did he not fail in his way? Uh, one thing we know is that God encouraged him. You know? So he he did feel like when you read Genesis 15, he did feel like nothing is happening. Now this was about 15 years, so he must have been 75, 80, 90, when he was 90 years old. Um, uh, he, he, he felt like, God, nothing is happening. You, you said, you know, you'll give me children, nothing's happening. But then God encouraged him. That's the time in Genesis 15, God told him to look up in the sky and says, Abraham, as numerous as the stars in the sky, that's how many your descendants will be. Somebody who's born from your you and Sarah. No? So, so God encouraged them. Then again in Genesis 17, God comes to Abraham and uh, you know uh, changes his name, Abraham to Abraham. So that's that's who you are going to be. You're going to be. So God encouraged him through you know by speaking to him, uh, uh, and I think that may you know help him stay. And. Then it is safe. So we, we can learn from that. You know, we need to keep ourselves encouraged in God's words. Yeah. Okay, let's take a break. The bells rung. I will come back in 10 minutes. We'll come back and we will continue on this. Uh, and also I'll look if there are any questions in the chat. Okay. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.